Welcome back. Today we are going to discuss theory of estimation. We are in the module of theory of probability. So, if we quickly review the topics that we are going to discuss in this lecture series, we have already discussed moment generating function and central limit theorem in our last class. Today we are going to talk about theory of estimation and it has actually two parts, point estimate and under point estimate we have method of moments and method of maximum likelihood and then we will have interval estimate and finally goodness of fit which will have again two subtopic chi square test and ks test so theory of estimation we have already discussed how to get the moments either from its basic definition or from the moment generating function and then we also discuss central limit theorem and its application now for all practical applications for example, a uh, design of a structure, uh, there we need to deal with different materials which are random in nature and therefore, we need to fix their properties. For example, if we take concrete which follows normal distribution, then in that case we need to estimate the parameters of normal distribution. So, in this series of lectures, we are going to investigate how to estimate those parameters. So, if we see the problem we have, we have random samples x1, x2 up to xn. Again, I go back to the example that we construct a structure where concrete is used. We prepare samples of concrete and then we test in the laboratory and for each sample, we have uh, the strength estimate and then those are basically these sample observations. Now, obviously, they represent the random variable x and whose parameters are given by theta. Now, this theta, we call it a population parameter because that represents the complete set of random variable x with all its possibilities. Now, when we start the design process, for example, again concrete, we do not have a clear idea about this theta. But we at best know these samples and from these samples, we wish to estimate what are the probable values of this theta. And that estimate we denote by say theta hat. Now, there are two ways we can do, we can solve this problem. First one is point estimate. In this estimate, what we do, we find out these values, those are sample values, that means x1, x2 up to xn. We call them sample observations and from these sample observations, uh, we try to find out the estimate and the function that gives us is called estimator. Apart from that, we also have interval estimations, which provides a confidence interval, that means it provides two bounds, lower and upper bounds, we call them confidence limit within which the population parameter is expected to lie. Again, all these estimates are from sample observations. Now, before we investigate how to find out these parameters, population parameters theta, let us first see what are the criteria of a good estimator. It should actually satisfy four different features. The first one is unbiasedness, second one is consistency, third one is efficiency and minimum variance and then finally sufficiency. We will go through them one by one. Now, if we have a statistic t obtained from the sample observations as an estimator for parameter theta and if expected value of t is equal to theta then only we call it an unbiased estimator of theta. If it is not, that means expected value of t is not equal to theta, in that case it is a biased estimator and the difference between these two, we do not call it error, we call it bias. The next property is consistency. When we estimate a parameter from the samples, 
our starting point are sample observations. So that means we have a number of observations from which we estimate this parameter theta. Now, if we increase the number of samples, intuitively we can conclude that our estimate of theta should be more accurate. That is the property of consistency. So, the accuracy should increase with the sample size. Mathematically, as limit n tends to infinity, probability of T n minus theta, that means this is the amount of error we have, we call it also bias, is greater than the allowable error. And as n tends to infinity, if this quantity goes to 0, then we call it a consistent parameter. Now, as a consequence, if we can take two estimates, say t and t prime, and we can also estimate the variance of t and variance of t prime. Obviously, if variance of t prime is less than variance of t, then it will be a better estimator. Or otherwise, if the variance of t is less than variance of t prime, in that case, t will be a better estimator of theta. And that comes from the efficiency or minimum variance. That means, if we use an estimator which gives me a better result in terms of variance, obviously that will be a better estimator compared to others. Now, if it is an unbiased estimator, then variance of t also is greater than this limit and this comes from the Kramer-Rau inequality which we are not going to discuss here because our focus is not on the theory of estimation from the statistics point of view, but we just use these uh, mathematical tools for reliability based design. However, this is an important information because in our estimations if required, we have to use this property also to check whether our estimators are efficient and it provides minimum variance or not. Finally, the sufficiency if x1, x2 up to xn are random samples and then t is a sufficient estimator of theta provided we can express all our observations. That means, we have x1, x2 up to xn, these are the observations and at these observations we can estimate the pdf which is f x1 given theta and the product of all these observations is equal to if we can express it in terms of g of t given theta and then h of x1, x2 up to xn, where g t of theta is a sampling distribution and the other function h of x1 or x2 up to xn is independent of theta. If we can re express this way, then we call t a sufficient estimator of theta. Now, with that background, let us consider an example. In this case, Suppose we have a random variable x whose population parameters are mean and sigma, obviously variance is sigma square. So, we have n samples and from that we try to estimate sample mean and sample variance and check whether they are unbiased or biased. Estimation of the population means mu and standard deviation sigma or variance sigma square. So, our sample mean in this case will be summation of all x i, x i as our observations 1 by n. So, that is the sample mean. We can verify whether this sample mean that means x bar is an unbiased estimator of mean, but let us take the variance. So, variance is nothing but the second central moment. So, you can see on your screen it is the expected value of x minus mu whole square. Now, we can expand because we know the expression. So, we put the expression of x bar and then we get the expected value as 1 by n summation of x i minus mu whole square. Now, if we expand this, obviously, we get the next expression and then on simplification, we can show that it turns out to be 1 by n square, then summation expected value of x i minus mu square plus if i is less than j, then summation 2 i's of expected value of x i minus mu times x j minus mu. Now, obviously, all these observations x 1, x 2, x n, they are independent of each other. 
and therefore, the expected value of x i minus mu times x j minus mu this will go to 0 because there is no correlation between x i and x j they are independent and then ultimately we get sigma square by n. Now, if we find out the estimator expected value of a square uh, that is from sample mean we basically get the expression expectation of 1 by n summation x i minus x bar square. Now, again this expression we can expand this square term and then if we do the simplification it turns out to be 1 by n summation of sigma square minus variance of x bar. On further simplification we get n minus 1 by n times sigma square which is not equal to sigma square. So, we started with samples and then we have seen that as per our definition expected value of a square which was 1 by n x i minus mu square then ultimately it is not equal to sigma square and hence a square is a biased estimator of theta. Now, if you put a square is equal to 1 by n minus 1 summation of x i minus x bar whole square then we can prove that this is a unbiased estimator of theta. Because in that case expected value of a square will be equal to sigma square. Let us consider a problem. So, we have sample observations z 1, z 2 up to z n. These are the observations for a random variable having population mean of mu and variance sigma square. Now, we propose two estimators theta 1 and theta 2. Theta 1 is the summation of all these sample observations divided by 8 and theta 2 is 6 times z 9 minus sum of z 2, z 5 and z 7 divided by 3. So, these are the proposed estimator and we have to check whether these two estimators are biased or unbiased. So, to verify that we take the expectation of theta 1 bar or hat. In that case we apply the algebra of variance and then finally, what we get expected value of theta 1 hat is 7 by 8 mu. While if we carry out the same operation over theta 2 hat, then after simplification using variance algebra we get its value to be mu. Obviously, theta 2 hat gives mu while we take the expectation of this estimator and hence the second one is a it is an unbiased estimator of mu. So, if we consider a different example, find the unbiased estimate of mean and standard deviation for the random samples 14, 19, 17, 20 and 25 and estimate standard error of sample mean. So, in this case we can find out the sample mean easily. We have altogether 5 observations. So, we can easily find out the sample mean which is nothing but 1 by n times summation of x i and this gives the mean estimate from the samples to be 19. Similarly, we can also find out a square that is the variance and which turns out to be 16.5 in this case based on the sample observations and the sample mean we have already estimated. Now, to find out standard error for sample mean recall we have already discussed central limit theorem and in that case we discussed what was the variance it was sigma by square root of n. So, if we find out we can estimate this standard error however, sigma you can see on your screen this sigma is nothing but the population standard deviation. We do not know this because we only have 5 observations and from that we estimate the standard deviation. So, in absence of sigma we use the value of a square and take the square root of that that is my sigma and then we divide it by square root of n and we can estimate the standard error. In this case because we have no information about population standard deviation we use the sample standard deviation and estimate the error. 
So next we move towards method of moments and let us see how we can use this to estimate the population parameters. So if you recall we have a random variable whose PDF is given because that is how we describe our problem statement. So we have a random variable x whose PDF is given by f x small x given theta, theta is the population parameter and then from this PDF we have some observations like x1, x2 up to xn which are independent and identically distributed because they all come from the same PDF. In that case the kth population moment as per definition of moment is expected value of x to the power k which is equal to an integration over the complete domain in this case it is a continuous function and therefore the limits will be minus infinity to plus infinity because we are looking at kth moment obviously it is x to the power k times f of x small x given theta dx and as we keep on changing the values of k we get different moments for example if we put k equal to 1 we get the first moment k equal to 2 we get the second moment and so on. Now at the beginning we have no idea about theta because that is unknown and we are going to estimate this unknown parameter from the sample observations and if you recall we can define the sample moment also. So in that case kth moment and in this case please note the symbolic representation it is small m subscript k that is the kth moment obtained from the samples will be equal to 1 by n summation of x i to the power k x i is the observation and to the power k represents the kth moment and then we sum it up for all observations for k equal to 1 or 2 or 3. So this is the sample moment and then if we equate kth population moment with the kth sample moment that means expected value of x to the power k is equal to small m k for different values of k then we can estimate the parameters because on the left hand side we have theta unknown and then using this equation we can find out the unknown parameter. So let us take an example the time to failure of an electrical circuit in hour obtained from a random experiment on 8 samples are given below. If the random variable follows exponential distribution estimate its parameter. So we are given the observations we have 8 different observations and from that we have to estimate the population parameters and in this case the random variable follows exponential distribution. Of course there can be a question how do we know that a population follows exponential distribution that we will address in our future class. But for the time being if we assume that this random variable follows exponential distribution whose observations are given then using method of moments we can estimate the parameters of this distribution. In this case we have exponential distribution it has only one parameter lambda and if you recall the expression of PDF this is the expression of PDF for exponential distribution. So we have lambda e to the power minus lambda x for all x greater than equal to 0. So the population moment in this case let us consider the first moment as per definition over the complete domain normally for continuous variable we write it minus infinity to plus infinity however in this case x ranges from 0 to infinity obviously uh, we have to modify this limit accordingly because for all x less than 0 this value of x is 0 so obviously minus infinity to 0 is effectively 0 uh, for this integral. Now we have x times fx whose expression is given here and we have already derived this earlier so we can find out the first moment for exponential distribution and which turns out to be 1 by lambda. Now if we find out the sample moment in this case we have 8 different observations and from these values we can find out what is the sample mean. 
So, sample mean is nothing but 1 by n summation of all x i and if we just put these values here in this expression, we can get the sample mean as 21.65. Now, if we equate these two, we can estimate the value of lambda which in this case 0 0.0462. So, that gives us the estimate of the population parameter in this case the population follows exponential distribution. So, in principle what we do? We have kth population moment which is having the expression of pdf in terms of population parameter theta and then we have an iid sequence x1, x2 up to xn and then we equate these two and as per law of large number if n is greater than uh, sorry n, n tends to infinity 1 by n summation of x i to the power k is equal to expected value of x to the power k. Recall also the consistency we have already discussed earlier. So, we equate the population moment with the sample moment and then we find out the parameters of the distribution. We will actually discuss the consistency and uh, MLE again that is maximum likelihood estimate next. But before we do that, let us consider another example. So, we have a random variable x whose distribution is given and in this case again the samples are also given then we find out theta. So, again we find out population moment and then I put the expression we have the population moment as lambda plus 1 divided by lambda plus 2 and then we also find out the sample moment in this case the first sample moment which is mean and based on observation we get it to be 0.65 and then if we equate these two we can easily find out what is lambda. In this case lambda is equal to 0.86. So, what we can observe that sample moments that we estimate based on the observations, they are independent of population parameter theta because it comes from the observations. If we again recall the example of characteristic strength of concrete, in that case we conduct some experiment and from that experiment we can estimate the sample mean and sample variance. So, it does not depend on the population parameter theta and then to estimate theta we equate population moment with sample moment and as many unknowns we have that many equations we have to develop using this relation. So, for example, if we have two unknown parameters then obviously, we have to equate two different moments. Normally, we start with the first moment and then we check second moment, third moment and so on. So, as many unknown parameters in the population we have that many equations we develop and then we solve them to estimate the parameters of the distribution. Now, let us take an example of concrete testing. In this case, we have 100 samples of concrete cube crushed in the laboratory to find out its strength and you can see those 100 values are reported here. And in this case, we have to estimate the parameters of the distribution which is given so, it follows normal distribution and we need to estimate the parameters of the normal distribution. So, we have Q strength which is normal and normal distribution has two parameters mu and sigma. So, these two parameters we have to estimate from the observations we have. So, this is the expression of normal distribution and the range of the random variable is from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, in this case we equate first moment that we estimate from the population. So, and then we equate it with the observations. We have all these 100 samples. So, from that we can find out the sample mean. Similarly, we can also find out the second moment from the observations and then we can find out the variance also that is the second central moment and we have already derived this expression using variance algebra and then we can find out the variance from the observed values and from this variance we can find out sigma and because it comes 
from this sample observation where we have used 1 by n and not 1 by n minus 1 if you recall, then we get a uh, estimate of standard deviation which is biased and we can also estimate the unbiased value of sigma which is slightly different than the bias value, biasness we have already discussed. So, from this example what we can see based on these observations we can estimate the parameters. So, with this background let us move forward. Our next topic is maximum likelihood estimate, but before we go into the details of that, let us briefly discuss why we need this. If you recall the uh, previous discussion, if we have say two unknown parameters, we develop two equations and as I said, we start with the first moment and then we consider the second moment. So, if you have two unknown parameters in the distribution, obviously we take first two moments and then we develop the equations. Now, in this process, we never considered the other higher order moments because that was not necessary. We had to develop the number of equations as many unknowns we have in the population and then we solve those unknown parameters. Now, in this maximum likelihood estimate what we do, it was proposed by uh, Sir Roland Fisher. So, what it says if x is a random variable whose pdf is defined by x given theta, theta is the actually the unknown population parameters and then we have n observed values. Based on these observed values, we first define the likelihood function. So, in this case the likelihood function is given by this expression, likelihood of theta given x, x is the ensemble of all the observations that we have and then for each and every observation we actually satisfy that pdf which is f of x 1 comma theta and then we take the product of all this quantity and then we have the likelihood function. Then the maximum likelihood estimator MLE of theta is the value of theta for which this likelihood function is maximized. So, we have to maximize this function that means we differentiate this function with respect to theta and equate it to 0 the solution of this equation will give me the value of theta for which the expression is maximum and that also you can check by taking the second derivative of likelihood function with respect to theta. Now, we use the partial differential operator simply because there can be more than one parameter in theta. Now, if we graphically try to understand we have a parameter space and we have a observation space. So, in the observation space we have all these x 1, x 2 all these observations and for this we have a pdf which is defined by these observations as well as the unknown parameters and then we define a function where the unknown is the theta that is the population parameter and then we maximize this theta for continuous random variable we have the pdf to deal with and for discrete random variable we have discrete probabilities to deal with. Now, then we define this likelihood function accordingly if we have continuous or discrete random variable and then we maximize this function to find out the theta that gives the best possible values of theta so that the likelihood function or its log I will come to this point with example or its log that means we construct the likelihood functions then we take the log of this function and then either of these two function it is maximized. Because likelihood function always has positive values whether we maximize the likelihood functions or logarithm of that function the result is all the same. The question is why we take the logarithm of this function it has certain advantage that the moment we take an example we can easily investigate. Now, before we take the example let us physically understand what we do using this approach. So, again let us go back to the example of cube testing of concrete. 
we test the cubes in the laboratory and we have the observations which you can see these dots are the observations that we get from the test results. Now, for this observation if we wish to fit a distribution let us try with a sample in this case we know that the concrete strength follows normal distribution which is a symmetric curve you can see on your screen about the vertical line it is symmetric. Now, if you place this curve say at a location and try to see whether this curve fits the distribution we can easily conclude that it is not simply because for the normal curve we should have most of the observations near the point of symmetry and then as we gradually move from the point of symmetry the observations have less relative frequency of occurrence. So, if we slide this and put the observation and the PDF in a new locations, then probably this gives a better representation. The reason is we can see lot of observations are clustered and then in the observations also there is a symmetry and probably in this location if you place the PDF this will give a better representation for the data. Now, if we systematically do that exercise and start from one end and for each location if we find out what is the likelihood and then if we keep on sliding this position and for every case we estimate the likelihood function then obviously the point where we have maximum value of this likelihood is the location where if we put the PDF gives us the best estimate. Now, in case of say normal distribution it comes with different shapes and size based on two parameters mu and sigma. So, we have to repeat this procedure for mu and sigma and for each case we have to maximize the log likelihood and for that we differentiate this expression with respect to theta and equate it to 0. So, let us take an example. So, we have a Bernoulli random variable and for that the probability mass function is actually given and in this case first we define the likelihood function based on the random samples. So, we have say n observations and then for each observation we satisfy the mass function and then the take the product of that which gives me the likelihood function for this case. Our objective is to find the parameter p in this case and for that we maximize the function. So, we simplify the expression and we have the product of this and then if we take the logarithm of this function we get a better expression to deal with and actually taking log simplifies this because we have the summation in power and obviously if we take the logarithm that simplifies the expression and then we differentiate with respect to p and then equate it to 0 and then from this expression if we solve we can estimate p. So, this is for a Bernoulli random variable is 1 by n summation of all x i that means the sample mean is the parameter in this case. So, if we have an experiment and based on that experiment we have the observations and then we have sufficient number of observations from that we can estimate the parameter using maximum likelihood. So, let us take a different example we have x which is normally distributed with unknown parameters mu and sigma and for that we have observations x 1, x 2 up to x n. So, that is the shape of the PDF in case of normal distribution which has two parameters mu and sigma and the range of this variable is minus infinity to plus infinity. So, for this again 
we use each and every observation for each and every observation we find out what is the PDF and then product of that which is the likelihood function. Now again we can simplify this expression and then finally we take the logarithm and that actually simplifies the expression and then we differentiate the logarithm of the likelihood function with respect to mu and equate it to 0 which gives the first estimate of population mean which is the sample mean itself. Similarly, we can also differentiate with respect to sigma and then equate that to 0 which gives us the estimate of variance which is the population variance itself. Now, using these expressions then we can find out the parameters of this distribution. Let us take a different example. We have again observations x1 up to xn for a random variable x which is following Poisson distribution. So, for that we know the PDF and then again we satisfy this expression for Poisson distribution and then based on that we define the likelihood function. And finally, again we take the log likelihood and you can easily see the impact of taking log because it simplifies the expression to a great extent. And then we take the differential of this log likelihood function with respect to theta. In this case, we have only one parameter that is lambda and then we equate it to 0 and we can again see that this lambda is nothing but the sample mean. If we take exponentially distributed random variable, then again the PDF is lambda times e to the power lambda x i. Again the range of x is 0 to infinity. We can define the likelihood function first based on the expression of PDF and then we can take the logarithm of that and then follow the same approach. You maximize this log likelihood function with respect to theta and then you can estimate the lambda which is 1 by sample mean in this case. So, another example if you have gamma distribution then in that case we have the expression for gamma distribution again the range of x is greater than 0. These are the different shapes of gamma distribution based on the parameters involved and in this case we have two parameters in the gamma distribution one is r another is lambda. So, accordingly we define our log likelihood function and then that again simplifies this expression for gamma distribution and then we differentiate this log likelihood function with respect to r and then equate it to 0. Similarly, also we differentiate the same expression with respect to lambda and equate it to 0 and then we basically get two equations for lambda and r. From these two equation we have to solve, but uh, this is not very straightforward still we can solve this expression and we can find out what are the values of r and lambda. So, next example we have a uniform distribution uniformly distributed random variable has constant values of uh, pdf over a range of its interval in this case it is 0 to a. So, for that we define the likelihood function in this case we have only one parameter which is unknown the population parameter a. So, we get the log likelihood and then we take the log and we get this expression and then again we differentiate this expression with respect to a and equate it to 0. But in this case you can see the pdf on your screen ranging from 0 to a and having a constant value, but in this case we cannot solve the reason is log likelihood is having maxima at its bound and therefore, we cannot solve this example using MLE. So, always keep that in mind that if the maxima exist and then only we can actually use a maximum likelihood estimate otherwise we have to solve the problem using a different option. So, if we find out what are the properties of 
this maximum likelihood estimate. So, to start with MLE is a consistent estimate, but need not be unbiased if you recall our derivation for this normal distribution, we actually derived an, a, a biased estimate which was not unbiased. So, it is consistent at the same time it is not unbiased. If MLE exists, it is the most efficient estimate because based on all observations it actually satisfies the likelihood function which is maximum for the solution and hence it provides the most efficient estimate of parameter. Then if sufficient estimator exists, it is a function of MLE. Now, I will come to this later on. Now, if t is the MLE of theta and there exists a continuous function of f, then f of t is the MLE of f of theta. So, this is the property. We can also prove this, but we are not going into the details of that. Then, as you have already said, it is a consistent estimate. That means, as n tends to infinity, if we find out what is the probability of this difference between the estimate and the actual population parameter greater than the allowable error, then this probability of this goes to 0 as n tends to infinity. And that actually in turn satisfies the consistent criteria we have mentioned at the very top. Now, if we have x i which is an iid sequence of the pdf and then theta hat is the mle of theta, then, then this expression square root of n times theta hat minus theta actually tends to normal with 0 mean and the standard deviation given by 1 by i of theta. i of theta is the Fisher's information. So, it is asymptotically normal for the estimate theta hat which is the MLE of theta. And then if the minimum variance bound estimator, recall the Kramer Rao bound I talked about and if this minimum variance bound estimator is theta hat and that exists, then obviously theta hat is the MLE of theta. So, this last property comes from that Kramer Rao bound. All this together in simple word tells that if MLE exists, that is the best possible estimate of theta that we can have. So, with that, let us conclude our discussion today. In the next class, we will talk about interval estimate and goodness of fit. Thank you. Mm -hmm.